Yesterday I, I said that I wanted to go on a little bit more with King Arthur, uh, and I do. Um, I want to name two other works. If you did as I asked and you watched uh, a little bit of Sword in a Stone, uh, that cartoon, Disney's cartoon, great, I, I hope you did. I have another reason that I wanted you to see that. But you could come away from the Arthur stories thinking of them as just kind of fun and silly. And, and I think that would be wrong. Uh, when I go through, when I went through this teaching in public school, I, I, I was always aware that I could only take so much time with any given subject, and I didn't want to take too long with this. But uh, but I want to I want to mention this. In the 1950s, there was a very large uh, novel, I guess I'll call it, called The Once and Future King, published. It's written by T. H. White. Uh, I read it all. It was very good, uh, I think, and it was very well received as well. Uh, I, I recommend it highly, especially if you're a good reader, uh, a fast reader. It's quite long. Uh, but there's where Sword in the Stone, what Disney then did, not very long after that, uh, what Disney did with his uh, animated version uh, came from the first book in, in The Once and Future King. Uh, and Camelot, The Learner and Low Musical, it came from that as well. It was inspired by it. Uh, and I think maybe I was just at the right age at that time. Uh, I was in my teenage years to be ready to be very influenced by these stories. Uh, I was. Uh, and uh, so those, uh, I recommend them. You, you, Camelot, a musical, uh, there was a time when I, I knew all of those songs by heart. Uh, and I still am pretty fond of those uh, of those songs. But this one, Idols of the King, here I'm holding a very beat up copy of Idols of the King. This one, uh, many years I don't tell the kids about it, uh, because in a way I think maybe it's too obscure, it, maybe it's not famous enough, but I decided this year I'm going to tell you about it. Uh, it was written, it's a poem, it's about a 300 page poem written in unrhymed iambic pentameter, blank verse, much like Shakespeare would have written, unrhymed. Uh, it's tempting to call it an epic poem, but it's not really an epic. I think it's 12 separate poems that are joined together. Uh, it's wonderful. <laughs> I, I just think it's wonderful. Uh, and I guess to some extent this is personal testimony on my part. As I said before, I was of an age where I think I was very ready to be influenced by this. I think, I don't know when it started, but I've loved language um, all my life, I, I, I think. And, and, and not, not all poetry, but, but this kind of poetry, certainly. And um, this uh, version of it, uh, this is the very one that I bought when I was a 10th grader. That would be about 50 years ago. I uh, hope you can see that and move it up and down. Maybe. Uh, and I never wanted to let it go, even though it's, it's falling apart. Uh, and when I got it off the shelf this morning, I, I found here are the notes that I had taken 50 years ago because I did a book report on it in my 10th grade English class. This was the class uh, of Doc Blanchard, somebody early in the year. I tipped my hat to him uh, because of class vocabulary, if, if you can remember or if you ever look back. Uh, and I, uh, it was very interesting to read that, and very, very tiny writing. I don't know if that's worth showing you or not, uh, the writing of me as a 10th grader. But um, I agree with what I found. I had loved it. I, I, I had said at that time, and I say now, you don't want to read something like this very fast, because it's poetry. It's rich. I found it moving. And... Uh, uh, a line, later on, I read the whole thing out loud to my wife when we were first married. And I think I may do that again someday. I'll have to get another copy. I liked it that much. Um, I remember toward the beginning, there was a line that described England at that time as thick with wet, thick with wet woods. <laughs> That's not the whole line, but thick with wet woods. Uh, and uh, uh, it's just so musical. Uh, Thick with wet woods and many a beast therein was England of the time. 
But be behind this all, and that's what I want to make sure you realize why it is so moving, is that uh, here is the story of a king who was really too good for the world he was born into. England was not ready for such a good king. He had not really done wrong, but his wife, Guinevere, and his best friend, and his knights, they were not ready for such a good king. And so ultimately, his kingdom fails. He doesn't die at the end of Idols of the King, really. He passes. The last poem in the series is called The Passing of Arthur. Not the death of Arthur, but the passing of Arthur. And very, very beautifully written, this poetry, I feel. Uh, and uh, when it seems like he's to die, uh, this magical barge with magical-looking women come and take him. And they take him, I guess, to Avalon. Uh, I don't know the whole, everything there is to know about King Arthur. But, uh, and, in, and, and we're left with the idea that, well, maybe he'll come back. Maybe somehow in Avalon he can be healed of his grievous wound. And maybe someday he'll come back when England is ready for such a king. And, and this so beautifully then blends the, the idea of, of the, well, this absent king that people are waiting for his return. They, they lay it over almost with a Christian's attitude toward uh, Jesus and the second coming of Jesus, a, a, a Christendom waiting for a king's return. Uh, I think, as you can probably tell, I think very highly of this. And an and, uh, and, uh, iambic pentameter, when it's used to tell a story like that, uh, I, I think is gorgeous. I think Alfred Lord Tennyson has not lately been appreciated as much as he once was. And that's one of the reasons that I've been nervous about taking too much time with him, because I think, well, maybe he's too old-fashioned. But just on the chance that there's somebody out there that thinks they might want to look at something old-fashioned and gorgeous, uh, there you have Idols of the King.